broadcasting. Good evening, this is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami, Florida. Tonight we again have the pleasure of a continuing series of educational hangouts with Dr. Uh, A.Q. Rana, uh, MD, a neurologist and a noted Parkinsonism educator. He's world-renowned. World and tonight we're going to talk, be talking about a real problem in Parkinsonism patients, which is drooling. So first we'll say good, good day to the panelists. Hello, hello, Roxanne. Roxanne Davenport. Um, let me introduce you first. Roxanne Davenport is an epilepsy support uh, a person. Um, good evening, Roxanne. Hi. How are you doing? I'm fine. How is everyone? Very good. And Scott Scowcroft from Seattle, Washington. Good evening. Very happy and uh, glad to be in the panel. Thank you for inviting us. Yes, Scott is an IT person that used to work in, in a hospital, actually. And we have the guest of honor, uh, Dr. Rana. Good evening, Dr. Rana. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Dr. Bennett, uh, Roxanne, and Scott. Nice meeting uh, all of you. Okay, uh, Dr. Rana, take it away. You can present uh, uh, your thoughts on ruling in Parkinsonism. Uh, well, um, normal saliva is very important uh, for the process of uh, chewing and uh, swallowing as well as digestion, but about more than half of patients with Parkinson's disease, uh, they do complain of drooling. If you look at a patient uh, who is actively drooling and sitting in front of, in front of you in clinic, uh, you would feel that they are overproducing the saliva, uh, although the drooling is not due to overproduction of saliva, it is due to uh, decreased swallowing. So these patients, and, and even some reports have suggested uh, that uh, these patients have uh, less production of saliva as compared to normal people. So in these patients, uh, what happens, they don't uh, swallow their own saliva as frequently as a normal person would. Uh, so the saliva pools in their mouth, and then it starts dribbling in front of the mouth. And also their posture. Uh, if you see a Parkinson's patient, uh, their, their posture is kind of bent forward. Their, uh, their neck is bent forward, their whole body is stoked. So this also leads to accumulation of saliva in the front part of mouth, and uh, which leads to dribbling. So drooling is complained about uh, more than half of patients with Parkinson's disease. Uh, initially, patients... Uh, would uh, feel that drooling is mostly at night time and it's mild, but as the disease progresses, the drooling becomes worse as well. Uh, indeed, some patients in the beginning may have just drooling and they may not feel other symptoms of Parkinson's disease. I'll share a story of uh, a patient with uh, you folks I saw. So this person was uh, waking up uh, every day in the morning with a wet pillow. So his wife was tired of changing the pillow covers so he decided to see his dentist because he thought they were due to uh, poor dentures or something else. And so the dentist looked at it and uh, he did not find any cause. So then uh, this patient decided to speak to his family physician. So he realized that he was a bit slower than normal. So he was referred to our clinic and this is how he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So it could be a presenting complaint in some patients. Very good, very good, Doc. Uh, now, let me just ask you a couple of questions. How does drooling relate to Parkinsonism? Uh, the drooling is a very socially and physically bothersome uh, symptom of uh, these patients. Uh, these patients uh, uh, feel socially isolated because if they are invited to some parties or they are attending functions, so people tend not to sit with them or eat, uh, so this uh, causes them a bit emotional embarrassment. So this could lead to depression, and physically also, because their saliva is dribbling, so their shirt is wet, or their mouth is wet, or their um, beard is wet, and sometimes they have to wipe their mouth and lips very frequently. So wiping again and again, uh, again, and again leads to dryness. This could cause skin damage in these patients. And also family members feel a bit embarrassed uh, because this is a chronic disease. The primary caregiver is usually a spouse. So th this could affect uh, 
their relation in between them because uh, socially this is not something which is appealing. Uh, so um, in some patients, uh, to some patients it could cost a bit more um, uh, as I was mentioning before, another patient of mine who saw me and he had drooling so he also thought that this was due to his dentures so uh, he kept on going to his dentist. Uh, so the dentist changed uh, his dentures uh, in spite of uh, uh, the dentistry assured him that everything looks good but he insisted so uh, so his uh, his dentures were changed a couple of times and then when he saw me, he said, well, doc, I have changed uh, these dentures so many times. They're uh, so poorly fitting that uh, this damn drooling does not stop. So when I assessed him, I said, well, this does not seem to be due to dentures. It is a symptom of Parkinson's. Very good. What could be the consequences of uh, drooling to patients and the family members? Uh, as I was discussing before, uh, social isolation uh, also uh, also an embarrassment, uh, keeping a handkerchief, and uh, these patients starts uh, avoiding, um, they start avoiding other people or going out for uh, uh, for eating out and, um, and attending any parties because mm -hmm. of uh, this, uh, uh, this symptom, embarrassing symptom. Okay, so it socially isolates the patient. Now right. what, kind of, what kind of medications, uh, Dr. Rana, uh, can be used for this drooling? Uh, there are many different choices when it comes to medications. Uh, so some of the medications which we routinely use for these patients for other symptoms of Parkinson's, uh, when we start them on L-DOPA or other Parkinson's disease medication, their uh, drooling does improve. Uh, and I had a patient who I saw first time, so he was uh, started on levodopa. When I saw him second time, he came for a follow-up, and I said, "How are you doing?" He said, "Well, my drooling stopped." <laughs> so I felt that uh, as as the levodopa has just helped the drooling and has not helped any other symptoms. So I said, uh, "You know, your other symptoms did not improve." He said, "No, I'm I'm more fast now. My energy level is better. My tremor is less." But he again said, my drooling is also stopped. So I realized that drooling was very important to him as compared to slowness or tremor. He was being bothered by it. So when we adjust these medications or increase the dose of uh, levodopa, drooling might improve. Uh, other choices are anticholinergic medications such as trihexyphenidyl, uh, low-dose amitriptyline if it is used for some other reasons in these patients, although we try to avoid uh, these medications in elderly and uh, also the atropine drops which uh, ophthalmologists use for eye conditions so if they put in the mouth that also uh, helps to stop the drooling and when I see my patients and uh, it happens to me quite often uh, when I write them atropine drops in the mouth one drop two to three times a day so I always get a call from a pharmacist saying, well, these are eye drops and you are, you know, <laughs> and you're telling them to put in them out. <laughs> you have to call them back. Yes, these are eye drops, but, <laughs> but we are using them for drooling. So now I started writing that, um, you know, in big letters that, okay, to use orally. <laughs> Another choice is a scopolamine patch. This is the same patch with uh, which uh, some people try for the motion sickness uh, if they go on a cruise or something. So this patch, if you put, um, it's applied behind the ear and it could be okay for three days and you replace it and uh, these patients feel better. Another choice if these things don't help um, is uh, botulinum toxin. So we inject botulinum toxin which does help, uh, which does help drooling. You know, I'm surprised you mentioned that uh, before, botulism toxin, uh, because we all have heard of botulism, um, so I guess it's obviously in a, in a non-damaging form. Now, now, how does the patient get that botulism toxin? Where, where is it injected, Doc? So we inject botulinum toxin in the parotid glands because most of the saliva is produced by the submandibular and parotid glands. 
So these parotid glands are located behind in, in the front part of the ear, above the angle of the jaw. So we inject on both sides, low dose botulinum toxin, and within a week, patient starts uh, feeling that uh, their drooling has uh, decreased. Uh, so the problem is that these injections have to be repeated every three months, three to four months, and uh, but it does help. Uh, so the dosage of botulinum toxin could be variable and it depends upon how much problem a patient has. If they have very mild drooling, then low dose of botulinum toxin may be okay, but if they have a lot of drooling, uh, then they may need a higher dose. And also, if you inject them in the beginning when the drooling is less, uh, the help is more as compared to if you delay it. Do most general neur neurologists uh, inject that or just Parkinsonism specialists? Mostly those uh, those neurologists who deal with Parkinson's disease, they usually inject uh, these kind of uh, uh, drugs or toxins. Okay. okay, yeah, I'm not I'm not familiar with any other indications of botulism toxin, but uh, okay, uh, I think uh, Scott and Meredith, uh, Scott and Roxanne, excuse me, may have some questions because I know Scott had a grandfather with uh, Parkinsonism. Scott, do you have any Scott and Meredith, do you have any questions? I I did, and let me just jump in with with a couple of uh, questions. The first one is: Is uh, drooling an early indicator for Parkinsonism? Uh, is it something that is, is is an onset of that before people might realize something else is going on? It could happen in some patients before you see the other symptoms, but usually patients have more symptoms before drooling, and uh, sometimes if you look at them carefully, if you examine them carefully, because sometimes motor symptoms could be very mild. They could be so subtle that you need to see them maybe twice or examine them very carefully, and then you see that they have motor symptoms. But sometimes if they are old and they are slow because of other reasons such as arthritis or so, so uh, the slowness could be neglected. People may take it as a part of aging and say that this is just an aging process. You know, and I'm, also one, I'm sorry, go ahead, Scott. Well, excuse me. I'm also wondering if there might be some benefit of education in terms of the dental field. Should dentists, are, are dentists fully aware, uh, sufficiently aware of what's going on, or, or could they benefit from learning a little bit about drooling as being a symptom for Parkinson's? Uh, the uh, dentists are not trained to diagnose Parkinson's disease, so they may not pick up uh, the symptoms of Parkinson's or signs of Parkinson's, same as we are not trained to treat dental issues, so that is not uh, the scope of their practice. But when we inject uh, these patients with botulinum toxin, uh, what happens, the, sometimes the saliva production decreases, so uh, because saliva is, uh, uh, is necessary for normal dental health, so we ask these patients to see dentists uh, on regular basis to avoid dental caries. So there is a role of dentists in patients who are injected with botulinum toxin because of drooling. You know, a, you. Sim a similar circumstance occurs with diabetics, uh, Doc. When, uh, Sometimes uh, diabetics are initially uh, diagnosed, or not diagnosed, but suspected by the eye doctor who sees changes in their fundi, and they send them to see the family doctor saying, wait a minute, you have changes in your fundi to be suspicious for, for uh, diabetes. Right. Have, you, have you ever seen that, Doc? Uh, uh, we had a patient, uh, she was 19-year-old uh, female, so she had type 1 diabetes, which was diagnosed uh, about one and a half year before the onset, before, uh, I mean, uh, after the onset of, uh, of the eye symptoms. So it could happen in rare cases that if they have a borderline diabetes, which is going on for some time, and when they are tested, their fasting blood sugar is normal, so they could have these changes, mild changes, and uh, if a retina specialist looks at them carefully, they could detect some changes before. Yes, it could happen. Okay, Roxanne, do you have any questions? Do you use any uh, like uh, guided equipment, ultrasound, CT, anything like that when you go to inject? Uh, uh, some uh, uh, some physician might do it under ultrasound. 
but those people who inject botulinum toxin very frequently, they, they should not have any problem. Usually we don't need ultrasound guidance, but if you do it to be more precise and to be more accurate, or if you're doing a training, then it should be fine. Yeah, I, I believe ultrasound is a lot more common now in, in hospitals. It, it's kind of it's portable. Uh, Roxanne, weren't you mentioning something about exercising, muscle exercising? Yeah, right. Uh, also, are there exercises when you first notice any kind of problem with getting into the drooling? Could you, you know, jaw or any kind of motion? Yeah, uh, with exercise? respect to uh, yes, with respect to drooling. Uh, when we see patients and they have very mild problem with drooling, we do suggest them uh, some uh, methods and strategies which could help. Uh, one of the things is that they should be more aware of their posture, their forward posture. They should keep on keep on correcting their forward posture, trying to keep their head straight, uh, keeping their uh, lips closed if they are not eating or they are not talking, and also. Uh, chewing a gum, uh, because chewing a gum is an activity which uh, uh, builds up their, or at least it kind of helps to retain their spontaneous swallowing reflex, and research has shown that it does help uh, in improving drooling. Uh, also, we tell patients to avoid any sugary foods uh, which uh, cause the production of saliva. <laughs> Very good. Well, we had some excellent questions from the panel. And as usual, a uh, great presentation from Dr. Rana uh, in the continuing education of uh, Parkinsonism on Parkinsonism TV. Uh, so we appreciate everybody. And Dr. Rana, we'll see you probably in the next night or two about uh, more on Parkinsonism. Sure. So, thank you very much. So thank you very much.